Hello marketing students, it's Dr. Grayson. I hope you're doing well today. It's another gorgeous day here in St. George, Utah, and I hope you are doing well during our second week of quarantine and our new format of online classes. We're getting there and I'm so grateful to all of you for hanging in and doing such a great job with your assignments and engaging with the, the new online format. So thank you very much for that. Our topic for today is the second of three topics in integrated marketing communications. So last time, if you remember, we discussed the whole planning process of the steps that you can take to build an integrated marketing communications plan. And if you remember the definition of integrated marketing, it's all of those things or touch points and messages that we have that we create as one organization to make sure they all come together well to align to our brand promise and value that we want to deliver to the customer. So what we're going to talk about today are tools that we can use to help get that message across. Um, the third thing, or the third part, the next video that I'll pull together will be how to create that message. So think about today being kind of the things that you can use or the tactics that you can develop and the channels for which you can sell, um, send your message through. Let's get started. This is what I want to accomplish for you today. Here's our big points. We're going to define the objectives of a purchase path. So the business objectives, what we want to accomplish by promoting. Then we're going to spend some time looking at various traditional and digital promotion channels and why you may want to use one over the other depending on the message and the target audience. And then we're going to determine which promotion tactics are aligned to different stages in the buyer's journey and what you might want to do to achieve those business objectives that you set forth in the beginning. And then what I want you to think about as we run through each of these different types of promotions, how are you going to use them in your marketing plan or your portfolio for your business? So that's what I want to talk about today. First of all, we're going to start with your assignment that is coming up due. And now remember that the assignment is the integrated marketing communication strategy. And it all starts out with the buyer's journey. Last time we looked at the buyer's journey in detail, and I want you to revisit that, maybe have a sheet out available as we walk through this. Now your assignment that is coming up will include the completion of the buyer's journey for one or, or at least two of your target audiences. So you're gonna complete two of those journey maps. Then you're also going to create a, an integrated marketing communication plan or calendar. And you can do that in any way you prefer, or you can use a template that I have provided. Once you get these two pieces together, like we always do, we create a one page summary that you can, you can give to an investor or that you can have as you talk about a plan for your business to other stakeholders. So you're going to have the summary, the buyer's journey maps, and the integrated marketing calendar. Let's get started at looking at some, some topics. So here you go. Here's, the, here's the, the two templates that are available to you in the assignment located in Canvas. The first thing I want to talk about is promotion objectives. A promotion objective is basically what you want to accomplish as a business. And depending on what objective you have or you have established is going to uh, drive the type of promotional tools that you're going to create. So let's look at it this way. I have a funnel here. Those of you who are familiar with sales know that sometimes we call our sales process a funnel. 
And what that is, is getting somebody to understand or notice us, identify they have a need, and the stages that we go through to get them to close the sale. So in traditional sales team terms, this is called a funnel. I prefer to use a journey, which is linear and circular because we bop around as people. But I'm going to show you today when building your promotion objectives, how you can use a funnel strategy to sort of compartmentalize and think about the types of tools you can use to accomplish these goals. So the first thing we start off with is, is creating awareness. If you recall from the buyer's journey, this is, this is step one. And creating awareness is the consumer has to know they have a need. If they don't know they have a need for your product, they might not buy it unless it's some sort of impulse. So the first thing they need to know is they need to know that they have a need for something. So last time I talked about buying my vehicle in St. George, well, guess what happened to me this week? Sorry for the story, but you know me, I like to tell stories. Uh, I have this new house and my son is living here with me because of the COVID-19 virus. So he's left the germ factory, which I call his student housing apartment. He's back with me and he parked his car out in front of our brand new home on the street. Uh, so what happened the other day was a forklift, a great big old forklift came by, plowed right through my, my son's car, literally plowed through it. Car is totaled. So hence, I'm back to the drawing board, having to look for a new vehicle. I know it's a nightmare, it's a horrible story, but I have a need. I know I have a need because my son is using my car. And even though I am in lockdown here in my beautiful new kitchen, he's off with my car. So I can't even go to the grocery store. Anyway, I have a need. So this first thing that we do when we have a need is a company needs to create awareness to let me know, yeah, you, you, you have a need and I'm there to solve it. So when we have a need for a product in our business objective is we want consumers to know when they have a need, new need, like Dr. G needs a new car because hers got rammed over by the construction forklift. Don't ask me how this happened, but it, hap it happened to me. Um, she needs to know that she has a need and we need to get in front of her when that need arrives. So I call these eyeballs. So one way to create awareness is by getting eyeballs on your company. And there's lots of different ways that we're going to attract eyeballs to our company. And I'm going to show you that once we go through the funnel. So I know I have a need. The second thing, once I have a need, I start searching for people who can solve my problems or companies who can solve my problems. So what's whirling through my head here? You know, I know how much money I'm going to get from my, my vehicle being totaled. So now I know how much money I can spend for my son's vehicle. So I start to search for information like, well, what kind of vehicle are we going to replace it with? I'm in Utah now. Am I really going to get a pickup? Because I guess that's what you do when you, you live in Utah. You get a pickup. I've never had a pickup before. My other son has, but I haven't. I've had an SUV. So I start to search for information to solve my need. I look at types of cars, prices, maybe I'm looking for dealerships. So when, when you know you have a need, you start to search for information. And we need to determine an objective for when Christy starts to search for information, we want her to think about us. So how are we going to get noticed? How do we make sure we are in her search set? So we'll talk about that when we get there. So we all know that once, once we start knowing we have a need and we're looking for information, where's the first place we go? 97% of us go to Google and type into the Google search engine. So that's what we do next. And, and so as a business objective, we want to make sure that Dr. Grayson is searching for something about her vehicle and that we pop up or we are populated in that information search. The third thing we look at is evaluating options. So now Dr. Grayson has these options of places where she, of vehicles, 
or of places she might purchase a vehicle. And what we want to do as a business is we want to have our hand raised and go, hey, hey, consider me. I'm the best. I've got the vehicle you want at the right price, at the right place, and you can get it, et cetera, the right color, everything you want. Evaluate me. So your goal, your promotion objective is to make sure that you are in that consideration set. Certainly, I'm not going to go to just one dealer. I'm going to look around. But if your company isn't in the consideration set, you no longer have Christy in the funnel. So you're going to consider me. And a consideration set, again, are those options available to me from my information search. The third or the fourth objective is now that I've got some options here, dang it, I'm ready to buy a vehicle because I'm sick of not having my own, even though it's been a couple days. Um, even though I have no freedom living here in my house, I'd like to think I have freedom. I'd like to be able to, you know, run up to Harmons and grab something if I can. So I'm ready to make a decision on a vehicle. I don't want to putz around anymore. So now as a business, what do I do? I attempt to get you to purchase from me. You have a consideration set of maybe three or four. What am I going to do to get you to buy now? Pick me, pick me. That's what this is all about. This stage is about making the decision. Sometimes we use pricing, sometimes we use features or other things, but there's some very um, pointed types of tactics that we use in helping someone make a decision. And then finally, yay, you created me, you picked me. Now what I want you to do is fall in love with me, just like a relationship. Once I've selected the vehicle from a particular company to purchase, fall in love with me forever. I want you to keep coming back. I want you to be loyal. I want you to spread your goodwill, your love, your kindness to everyone in the world on social media. So that is the, the last and final objective is to create loyalty. And we do that by having your consumer fall in love with your brand, just like you would a person. So those are the five types of promotion objectives in that purchase journey. Those are the things you want to accomplish. So how, let, let's look at some tools on how we can make this work. We're going to start off with creating awareness. How do we create awareness? There's a lot of different ways to do this. Now remember, Creating awareness is about getting eyeballs. People to make, making aware of, of, making people aware of the need they have and aligning your business to be that high level problem solver. That's what we want to do. There's the ways we do this. Public relations, social media, or storytelling, we're all familiar with with people talking to people, one-to-one uh, -one marketing, uh, or, or many-to-many -many marketing. Mass media, these are your traditional medias, television, radio, industry outreach. Maybe you're in a business-to-business -business, uh, type of product. You're selling a software product or something that you're not selling to a person, but a business, you might use some awareness through trade shows or industry associations. Digital marketing, these are all of the things, the tactics that we use to get you to know about us and to follow you once you express some interest. Affiliate marketing, so you are going to have your products or your web to your link on someone else's site and they're going to promote for you. And experiential events. So there's a lot of things in creating awareness. But what I want you to recall is that creating awareness is about getting eyeballs, not necessarily closing the deal, getting eyeballs and warming that person up to knowing concretely that they have a need. Now, one thing I want to make certain in this video is I'm not going to talk about specific messaging and how to do that 
That will come in the next video. I just want to get you aware of some of the tools that we can use. So I mentioned a few in the last slide, tools for awareness. There's lots of different ways that we can do this from creating press releases, interviewing, doing podcasts, social media, posts, blogs, sponsored events. There's a number of different tools to create awareness. Let me show you a few examples here. I have the Sprite ad, which right here is an experiential type of marketing. And so on a hot beach in Malibu or some other fancy pants place in California where all the, the beautiful people go to swim, um, Sprite had showers there, free showers. So people could, to, could be refreshed or wash the sand off or whatever they do when they're in the beautiful place. And it's designed as a, a Sprite dispenser. So kind of a cool little way. Obviously they're not selling anything. They're not selling their stuff. They're getting eyeballs and they're saying, yeah, you know what? Maybe I am thirsty. They're creating a need in a fun little sort of a play, playful way. Uh, another way I've got here, I've got um, the CEO of Apple. Apple does town halls when they introduce products. And a town hall is, is a type of meeting that happens with employees. And so what Apple does is they, they, they publicize their town hall meetings. So we all get to know at the same time what the next new gadget is that Apple's creating and all of the wow around it. So that would be another way of creating awareness. Um, experiential marketing such as, you know, car wraps, things like that. You're not gonna necessarily buy something, but it's going to, these types of things are going to be top of mind. And maybe the next time you have a need, you might think about them. So uh, Red Bull, Red Bull has made a career out of, and a whole discipline around uh, experiential marketing and creating their own media and events to raise awareness. Uh, so this is something special that they do. So just a few examples that might be out of the ordinary that you might think. But I want to hone in on the importance of these things. The importance good awareness addresses a need. So let's look at a traditional ad. This is a print ad for Ricola cough drops. And I'm very sorry, it's kind of inappropriate me, for me to be using this at this time of uh, we're supposed to be social distancing and I show an ad for cough drops. And this particular ad is she's <coughs> just a friend. So what is the need here? The need for the cough drop is because there is some kissy face going on, right? Obviously there's some germ spread through that. Again, sorry, a little inappropriate, but wanted to tell you that nowhere on here does it say you need a cough drop. It uses very playful imagery and wonderful copywriting so you'll get the message. It's creating awareness and it's using a great message to address need. Now I've got one, um, note to self, again, a bit inappropriate, but I'm, I like to get my message across, so I like to use uh, fun examples. Here's um, KFC. KFC uh, made a boo-boo from a public relations perspective. I uh, can't remember exactly the details off the top of my head, but something went wrong with the chicken. Maybe they ran out of chicken. And so they addressed this. People had a need for, for chicken and they, had, they couldn't get their chicken, so they were upset. So. KFC, from a public relations perspective, said, you know, we're just going to come right on and say, yeah, we messed up. So you could say they played with their letters and they did the FCK instead of the KFC, which I think is a very clever way of saying, whoops, uh, made a mistake. So good awareness addresses a need. In their case, their need was to apologize to their customers for the boo-boo that they made. All right, another, another important media channel for creating awareness is social media. Notice I do not call this social marketing. 
That is, that is an error that many of us make. We think that social media is marketing. Marketing, as you know, is far more holistic than a media channel. Social media is a channel by which you send your message through. You still have to have incredible messaging. Uh, in social media, you have the good, good visuals. You have to have a purpose, an objective, uh, maybe an offer, depending on, on where you are. But, but remember, social media is a channel. You still have to have all of the important strategy in your marketing and your message for that particular channel to work. But social media is an incredible channel for gaining awareness, getting eyeballs. Because even if you've noticed in the last week and a half, the shift of people going to communicating through social media, um, that's where our eyeballs are right now. So, so using these channels when people um, for pure awareness is, is, is a very good strategy. Social proof. Social proof here is using social media channel to communicate the message that, hey, hey, we're good, we done it, we rock. So customer reviews, think of Amazon, ratings and reviews. Um, social proof are those things that indicate proofs in the pudding. Other people are talking about us. Uh, so there's lots of ways to use social proof as a communication tactic. So, so there's, I wanted to, to talk about paid social a little bit. So there's social media, and social media, any, any business can have a social media channel, a Facebook channel, an Instagram page, whatever, Snapchat, you can have whatever you want. Um, in the olden days, when I first started in social media, working in through that channel or adding it to my communications mix, it was all about just communicating with your customers or anybody who bumped into you. And that was traditional word of mouth advertising, where it, it, it's, it's more of like the brochure where you wanted to engage with your customers. Um, however, it wasn't paid advertising. So the difference between using a social media channel from the word of mouth is people talking to people or you talking and engaging with your customers, whereas paid social is actually paying for that promotion through that social media provider, like a Facebook ad or an Instagram story. You are going to pay for that placement. So there is a difference um, between the two. So I wanted to be clear about that. Traditional mass media advertising is also a an awareness strategy. And if you remember when we talked about planning, we had, um, we, we had the, the, the one-to-one -one or the one-to-many and the many-to-many. -many. We had that whole sort of landscape of different ways you can communicate. Traditional media is what I call the spray and pray method. You're gonna get a lot of, you're going to get in front of a lot of people, but it's going to be less targeted. Then I have, I've got some favorites here. I'm a fan of product placement. Um, and I've done a lot of this in my career with consumer electronics and other things. So product placement is another way that you can gain awareness for your brand without selling anything. So think of some examples here, American Idol and their Coca-Cola cups, or the Terminator and the Pepsi machine, or Wayne's World and, and Pizza Hut. But when you see a product within a television context or a movie, uh, that's what we call product placement. And I, I'm a big fan of this. I have seen it work. Um, at least in, in my career. I will say it's very expensive, but what I do like about it is their shelf life. So think about the number of times you have watched um, the episode of the Big Bang Theory when uh, Kutra Pali is talking to Siri. Siri, could you please uh, get me uh, whatever, the nearest donut shop? And so when Apple introduced the Siri technology, they introduced that product 
through the Big Bang Theory. Another brilliant thing that they did was they played on their weaknesses, sort of like KFC did in that last example. They communicated that Siri doesn't always get it right. So they poked fun in, in, at, at their product and, and highlighted you know, some of the things they're working on in a really fun and playful way, but it was also a really, really good product placement when I show it almost all my classes. So let's go back to the promotion objectives. Uh, so we, we're done with creating awareness. Those are those high level things we do to create eyeballs. Now we're searching for information. Who can solve my problem? I'm gonna buzz through these. So searching for information is again, ensuring as a company that you are found when somebody is searching on their need. We do this um, in a number of different ways. Most of us start our product and service inquiries through a search engine. We call that search engine optimization, like Google or Yahoo are big, but most of us start on Google. There's different types of search searches, organic and paid. I will walk through those. There's voice search and visual search as well. So remember, you have a problem like, hey Siri, what is the best restaurant in St. George, Utah? The best rated one I see is Hawaiian Poke Bowl on East St. George Boulevard, which averages five stars. Want to try that one? No, thank you. The next one is St. George Taco Truck on South River Road, St. George, see? about five miles to your south. That's what we call voice search, but that is what we do as people. We ask Siri about helping us solve our problem. So if you are not in that information search, chances are uh, you, need to, you need to get a good marketer to help you figure that stuff out. So let's talk a little bit about search engines. Search engines are algorithms or warehouses of information. So Siri has a warehouse of information. Um, it's a, oh, I've, I've got an old stat here. It says 67% of all searches start on Google. It's more like 93%. I need to update this. So there's three search engines. There's Google, there's Bing, and there's Yahoo. And these search engines will feed other search engines like AOL or Comcast. So you've got your typical search engines that we're all used to. You also have, think about alternative search engines such as for product searches. So when you're looking for an actual product, where are you gonna start? I should put a poll in here, but my guess is that about 85% of you are gonna go to Amazon and plug in whatever your product want, donut, whatever your product is for the day. Um, that is also a product search engine. There's other things like Craigslist we might look at, or Facebook, or eBay, or YouTube. These are places where we don't necessarily always start with Google. If we are pretty um, sure the type of product we want, we might just go right to a search engine. So there's two types of searches. There's organic search and there's paid search. So as a marketer, this is really important. And we spend a lot of time talking about this in promotions management or digital marketing uh, courses that I teach. And we talk about the importance or the difference between organic. Organic is your freebie stuff. The search that, um, a search that populates through an algorithm in a search engine based on the copy and the strategies that you put on your web pages. So search engines actually troll every single one of your web pages and looks for keywords, meta tags, and links, and other things on your pages that will help you rank highest. So your goal always as a marketer is to ensure that if you, that, that you are in the, the, one of the top two or three spots under all of the paid advertisement on Google. This is what we call organic. And this is simple search engine algorithms 
scraping each one of your web pages. So this is a discipline in and of itself. It is not rocket science. You can all do it, but it is putsy work. So, but, but it's very important. If you're gonna do anything right out of the gate, beyond your brand, get your search engines, your websites optimized for, for good search engines. So this is organic. This is stuff you don't pay for. Paid search are all of those things. Paid placement. Of, of advertisement. So let's look at my page here. We've got the paid, this, this is an actual um, product line from my old job. Um, a very prominent um, residential homes company. And so what we did here was attempt to create a page takeover. And by that is, is everything on the top and on the sides are paid placement. So by this, I mean that every time someone clicks on one of these ads or links, you have to pay for that. And I will tell you, paid pay-per-click advertising is a really good thing. It can also be very expensive in certain categories. Um, I will tell you that when I worked in the Internet of Things and sold security cameras, um, you might be surprised that one click could cost us $300 because it is such a heavily populated area. So look at the difference here. So, you, so, so yes, it can be good. Uh, you should do it because it, it, if you can, if it's reasonable and you have the right marketing budget, you should consider testing some paid, app, paid, paid search. So you can see the difference here is we have the paid here. So every time somebody clicks on one of my ads here, I'm going to have to pay that, that, you know, click fee. Here is my organic. So Honeywell Wi-Fi thermostats. So you can see here I typed in Honeywell thermostat and this was the page. We, we, we own the entire page here. Um, this is the organic. So this is the freebie stuff that happens based on really good web page design using keywords, backlinks, other tips and tricks that go with search engine optimization. So again, there's classes you can take on this, but I want you to know this will be an important part of your evaluate your search options. There's also location-based search. Remember when I did um, my little my little Siri experiment here? That was a location search. I said Siri, hey Siri, can I have the you know? Whoops, sorry, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. No, I don't want to try it again. Okay, I'll put her away for now. This is where you're going to search on a particular locale. So uh, depending on what area you're in, you can bid and you can design your search based on St. George, Utah, or maybe Washington County, or maybe the United States. So you, when, when you're working through your search engine optimization strategy, you, have, you need to decide whether you want to focus locally or you want to focus you know, nationally or globally. There's also another strategy called location-based strategy. I used to use this when I owned a web store for a large smart home company. And this web store, you know, I was selling direct to consumer. I had my own store. It was the manufacturers. So it would be like you going to Nike.com instead of going to Foot Locker or some other place. So what happened was, because I had my own web store, there were other people in the organization who worked with retailers, such as like, let's say Best Buy or Target or Walmart. And sometimes these retailers were not happy about us doing local advertising uh, for my particular direct-to-consumer store. So let's say Foot Locker isn't happy that Nike.com is doing local advertising in St. George. So you're going to have a conflict between managing a relationship, a retailer, and managing your own web property. So I um, worked uh, as a marketing strategist on, on how, do you, how, could we, how could we come with a happy medium. So, so what I did was I called this the donut strategy. So you can take your search and, and market to people 
say what I did was anywhere five miles outside of the radius of a retailer for whom we had a relationship or a contract with, I would not market to anybody directly. They would populate in the place of my web store. If I was outside that five miles, then yeah, I want to pick up people because chances are they might go to my website and get the sale. So it's, it's really creating a strategy that doesn't leave money on the table, but then doesn't alienate your other channel partners. Hopefully that makes sense. So this was all about search engine optimization. We, I, I showed you an example of voice search. Voice search is going to blow past social media channels and it's already on its way. Uh, did, you know, I, 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 I'm sort of a conspiracy theorist, theorist when it comes to marketing. Voice search is where it's at. You can see everybody talks to Siri. Uh, most, many, many, many Americans now have Amazon uh, Alexa or Echo in their home. And using voice search to get what you want. You know, Amazon, or I, I could turn on my radio right now. I could turn on my Bose player, but I won't. Um, I, I could order I could order something from Amazon through my, my Bose speaker right now. So note that voice search is also an option and really important. Uh, I don't have on here, oh, visual searches. Let's go to visual search. So think of visual search as another way to search. So this is using uh, artificial intelligence to help you make that decision. So think of Warby Parker, which is really kind of cool. They've got an app. Um, this is a direct-to-consumer eyeglass store. You've probably seen some of their commercial streaming or wherever you consume your media. Um, and, and so you can, you can design your look and your glasses based on an app. So this is a visual search. So we're really starting to not only give you information about where to buy, but we're starting to get you down the purchase path by letting you try things on. So that's a visual search. That's, you're gonna see more and more of that. So, so that's search engine. Really, really important for you to understand that this needs to be a component of your marketing strategy. There's also other types of, of support media that I, I call this air cover for awareness, um, directory advertisement. You know, I don't know if anybody actually uses Yellow Pages any day, but there's certain directories that are still out there. Out of home media, uh, that, that would be like car wraps or you, you, out of home could be a, bill, a billboard that you would see going through the, the street or it could also be something like um, the indoor advertising, like the, the things you, you see when you're in the ladies room and it's like, uh, yeah, advertising right there in the restroom. There is a captive audience and it does work. Sometimes it's a little weird when you see one of your students staring back at you because that happens to be the ad, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, so, so, so think about different types of air cover is what I call it. You know, just gaining awareness, getting your brand out there. Uh, then we have display advertising, another form of digital marketing. So display advertising are those, those, those beautiful uh, cookies that are, are, are developed to follow our purchase path or our footprint, our digital footprint. So if you're in your search and you're like, I just searched, you know, best restaurant in St. George and maybe Painted Pony comes up. What's going to happen then is due to my search, I'm going to start getting cookies or display advertising following me for Painted Pony based on my previous digital touch point or my search action. So display advertising is a very important component to being able to uh, be front and, and center around that person's search. Programmatic advertising, this is just a way that you buy media. Back in the olden days when I worked in marketing, uh, we would work with what's called a media buyer. Now programmatic advertising helps allow us to bid on certain digital display or AdWords 
or um, it allows us to set a budget for our marketing and uh, bid a certain amount without ever having to have a third party. So it's all automated. Very cool stuff. All right, so we've gone through creating awareness, searching. Uh, now we're gonna think, uh, look at evaluating options. So evaluating options, if you recall, now that people are aware of you, that they have a need and that you can solve it, and you're popping up in their, their mind as a potential option to solve their problem, now we look at how are we going to make sure that we are the one you're going to choose. So a consumer starts to place people in or products or services into their consideration set. Uh, so think about this as uh, tools you can use to help differentiate your value compared to your, your competitors. We do this through comparison charts, price engines, expert publications, ratings and reviews, blogs, vlogs, YouTubes, etc. So comparison charts, what I wanna point out here, remember in our pricing and budgeting exercise we did, I made you create comparison charts of your value compared to your competitors? There's a reason I had you do that, and that is because it's really important for you to understand your value and to get the value uh, from a price perspective, but it's also a tool that you can use if you have more features or more value that's important to a consumer than your competitor, use a comparison chart on your website to show the differences. So I'm gonna show you a few different tips that you can use in the evaluating of options. There's something called comparison shopping engines. These are engines that will collect a number of, of different price points and put them in one place. So it's almost like a search engine, but it's a shopping engine. And there's, there's like Retail Me Now and Price Grabber and places where people go. Uh, it's very price driven. So if this is, if you have more of a commodity product, might be something you may want to consider. But this is one way that consumers will evaluate options is looking at prices of different products. Like think of an Amazon, an Amazon search. You're going to comparison shop by a number of it features, price being one of them. Uh, video. Video is a good tool to use to help describe your value. And remember, when people are in the evaluating of options category, we want, we want to tell our story. We want to show our value that's unique to everyone else. Video is a great way to do this. And there's many, many statistics out there that will indicate that people would far prefer to watch a video than they would to read a bunch of text. So keep that in mind. Video is a good option. So those were just a few ways of evaluating options. Now we're gonna get down to the nitty gritty. The nitty gritty is, okay, you got the eyeballs, they know they have a need, you've gone into, you're popping up in search, you're in the evaluation set, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, consider me, consider me. Now you get to the, the you know, are you gonna buy it or not? Are you going to date the product or not? So this is the pick me, pick me. I'm the one. I'm the one. So we call this the making decision phase. And so in this case, there's lots of strategies that we do. One is optimizing your website, making sure that, that your product pages are appropriate, des, appropriately designed, um, that you are... You know, you've got the pricing there, you've got color selections, you've got lots of good vid uh, videos and pictures of what you're buying, all the information, ratings and reviews, all of the information a consumer needs to know to say, yep, I'm confident that you're the one. Help and chat bots, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Display advertising, again, we can use display more in the search or the awareness, but we can also use it for other, other things, such as if we know you've been to our website and you've been to the product page and you've clicked around, that's a good time to use a display advertisement that will follow the person and say, hey, you left something in your cart. Remember me? 
you still you still looking for for you know some furniture for in your new house all of those things are good good reminders because we want to nudge people into making a decision and then pricing and offers so let's take a look here for those of you who have not had consumer behavior or promotions management um, there is a concept called heuristics heuristics is uh, it's a concept that we call a rule of thumb. And the reason we use her heuristics is because it's difficult for us as people to remember everything. And a heuristic is a shortcut that we use to make a decision. So we don't have to uh, use all this brain power to make a decision, especially simple ones. So we use this theory in marketing to create messages to help people make a decision using a rule of thumb. Uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. So you'll see in this ad here, we're gonna come out and say, don't miss out. There's only 500 left. We're using fear of missing out. We're using the scarcity principle and we're putting an offer there. So this is helping, you know, creating a sense of urgency for the buyer to buy now. Availability is another heuristic and you're gonna see availability a lot in the airline industry, in the hotel industry, where you might have several different um, price points and they're gonna do something like, there's only three seats left. Uh-oh, well, I better buy it now or I'm not gonna go anywhere. Or maybe, you know, there's only two hotel rooms left at this price. So that's what we call availability. Another type of way to nudge somebody into making a decision is anchoring. Now, I have an example here of four different laptops. And anchoring is a, the science behind the way products are merchandised and positioned. We as people naturally will remember the first thing we see. So we anchor our product and our price in the first position. Then we will show the competitors. Here's my comparison chart. So remember, if you're doing a comparison chart, you're always gonna be the first. So in this case, we've got, um, we compare our product at, you know, what, what is it, 900 some dollars compared to these other products that are like way expensive, 3,000, 4,000. So guess what? It looks like you're getting a deal. So that's what we call anchoring. And, and these are all consumer behavior strategies to help us nudge a person into making a decision. Another thing that's really important in the evaluating or in the making a decision stage is chatbots or help. You want to make sure that wherever your consumer is in their journey, that you are right there to help them with any questions they have. You'll notice if you go to a lot of websites, you'll get a little pop up that says, hey, can I help you with something? Do you have a question? That's a chatbot. And a chatbot is just an automated computer program that is designed to answer very typical questions. It can get, a, you know, there's, there's lots of, of issues with chatbots if you serve up the wrong answer, but we're getting pretty good at, at collecting data and serving up the right answer. Uh, but so that's one other thing, help, self-help tools on your website. Uh, could be, you know, YouTube unboxing videos or how-tos. But the, the reason here that this is so important is that when you're ready to pull the trigger and buy something and you have a question, you need to get an answer. Or you're gonna lose the customer, they're gonna go to the competitor. If they're satisfied with the answer of the competitor, they might pay a little bit more or um, settle on something other than your product. So make sure that you have the best possible help tools to get that person. It could be people that, that, that call on a complicated product. You can call a tech support line. You can call a, a customer care person to help you make that decision. It could be automated. But optimizing your website with these tools is so very important. So finally, we, we've got you now. You're picking us. So what's next? What do we have left? I want you. You've picked me. Yay. Yay, finally. Finally, she gets picked. Oh, you love me forever. You want to keep that relationship with the customer. And we call this satisfaction, loyalty, advocacy, 
we want to have customers love us so much that we have a line out the door like they have at Apple when they re release a new product. We want to be the supreme of the world where people are going to buy out all of your product within the first 30 seconds and sell it on eBay for a $90,000 Oreo cookie. We want people to love us so much that they come back. And so there's an entire strategy around maintaining loyalty and satisfaction with your customers after they buy. This is a critical thing for you to understand because we can work really super hard at our marketing, but we're not marketing that first purchase. We're marketing the next purchase, the next conversation someone has with someone about your product. We want to maintain a lifetime relationship with our consumer. There's lots of different ways that we do this through rewards pro programs, ratings, reviews, satisfaction studies. So keep in mind that it's really important for you to know that once the transaction happens, your work is just beginning for a number of very strategic reasons. All right, that's been a long video, I get that. But it's, it, it, you're, most of you are just starting to dabble in promotion now. I encourage you to take the, the digital marketing class that I teach, promotions management, consumer behavior. These are all really great tools that we'll go into depth into and that will really help you understand the best way to promote your business. So today what we've talked about is that overall business objectives and, and making sure that you are aligning your objectives with the stage the customer is in. That's going to help you select which tools that we've used. We looked at a lot of different tools and I just scraped the surface. I could spend two, three semesters on this stuff and love every second of it. I want you to take these ideas and incorporate them into the integrated marketing communication plan that you're creating for your next assignment. So finally, here I am, Dr. G, give me a call, text me. I have virtual office hours every Tuesday, Thursday, three hours, 9 a.m. to noon. Zoom in, zoom out. Um, I can have a face-to-face -face with you or a conversation. And again, I hope you have a fantastic day. I'm really looking forward to seeing your promotion ideas for your businesses. I know we've been waiting for this for, for most of the semester, so I'm really happy that we're getting to this point. And thank you again so much for hanging in there with me with this online format. I know it's hard to watch a long video. I've been trying to do them in bite sizes, but we have so much information that that's important for you and the success of the businesses that you're creating. So stay healthy and happy, and I truly look forward to seeing you again someday face-to-face. -face. Take care.